Let's do it, man. All right, ladies and gentlemen, praise the living God. Welcome to the Jesus Revolution broadcast where Jesus Christ is Lord. Today, God's going to be glorified. People are going to be edified. And the devil is going to be terrified. I have with me one of my best lifetime long friends, uh, Scott Seiler. And uh, we're so happy to have him on the show today. Scott, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, my name's Scott and my lifelong friend, David Littlejohn. I'm, uh, I'm real happy that you're doing this. Uh, we grew up together down in South Florida. And uh, early on, uh, we were just wild guys together. And uh, David went on, grew up, became a medical man, and uh, is very accomplished in his field of geosymmetry. And I, for a time, was a pastor. Right now, I'm serving in uh, serving God in uh, real estate, and um, this is a refreshing opportunity for us to uh, engage again uh, the world with the Word of God and uh, to glorify Christ and focusing on Him and uh, who He is uh, uh, in the Word of God and who He is as our Savior, our Redeemer, and what He means and what He should mean. Uh, to this world right now in these uh, very different times that we live. Awesome. Scott, you're amazing. Thank you. And my name is David Littlejohn. Uh, let's see, I was a, I'm a second degree black belt, got in a fight, uh, tried to knock out a preacher twice. I didn't do too well. I ended up going to church. Woo, was that amazing. I ended up giving my life to Christ. And uh, right now I work in radiation oncology and medical physics. So we're going to get into this. It's going to be an amazing show. We hope you enjoy it. So number one, Scott, I have found that people uh, need to understand the law of contradiction. In order to have meaningful dialogue, you cannot violate the law of contradiction. This, this show, of course, is based on science, too, and rationality and laws of logic and the scripture, the Bible, the words of Christ. So the law of contradiction means that two antithetical propositions cannot be both true and not true at the same time in the same way. X cannot be a non-X and still be simultaneously correct. In essence, it cannot be both raining and not raining in the same way, in the same place, at the same time. So all logic depends on this simple principle, rational, listen to this, thought, and meaning, meaningful discourse demands it. So deny it, to deny it is to deny all truth. Scripture very clearly affirms the law of contradiction. 1 John 2, 21 says this explicitly. No lie is of the truth. The Bible asserts the law of contradiction. So today we're going to talk about who is Jesus. I'm going to kick this thing off. And Scott, we're going to interact here and share some insight and some theory and theology and some scripture. And again, the rules are you have to obey the laws of logic. So the question was raised in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 and 18. Jesus said to his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So the disciples said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Jeremiah, or some say you're one of those prophets. So men have different views of who Christ is. The second part of that question in Matthew 16 was Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And that famous verse where Peter says, I believe thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said that flesh and blood didn't reveal this to him, but his father. Today, we want to talk about who is Jesus? Who do men say in the 21st century that Jesus is? And who does Jesus say himself in the 12 apostles? Who do they say Jesus is? So I'm going to start with a couple of different groups. And, uh, and let's kick it off. Let's have some fun. All right. The Mormons, Scott, as we know, say that they believe in the inspired version of the Bible. And Joseph Smith emphatically declared that Jesus Christ is a created being that puts him in the creature class. You're either in the, in the creator class or you're in the creature created class. That, in fact, Joseph Smith says that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. Okay, it's a little rough one, but for my Mormon friends, Jehovah Witnesses out there, it's great to have you on the show. The Jehovah Witnesses with the New World Translation, they had five men create their own translation in the 1940s within their organization. There was no 
objective contrast, or it was totally biased. But Charles Taze Russell says that Jesus is a created being. As a matter of fact, he said he used to be Michael the Archangel. He came to the earth and became Jesus. And then he went back to heaven and changed his identity again. And now he's back to being Michael the Archangel. Again, they say he's a created being. My Muslim friends with the Quran and their prophet Muhammad believe that Jesus is a created being, that he's a prophet, he's a teacher, but that he's not the son of God, that he didn't die on the cross, he didn't rise from the dead physically. Um, so all three of these different groups say that Jesus Christ is a created being. Now, compare and contrast that with Christians, uh, Jesus himself and the 12 apostles, we believe that Jesus Christ is the creator. So getting back to the law of logic, the, the, law, the, uh, the law of contradiction, these all cannot be right. Are you with me, Scott, on this? I'm with you. Yeah. Jesus cannot be both the creator and then at the same time be the created or created being, Michael the archangel or whatever else you want to say, at the same time. It's a logical impossibility. They cannot all be right. Either the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, and the Muslims are right, that Jesus Christ is a creature, or the Bible, the 12 apostles, Jesus himself, and Christians are right, and that he is the creator. But they cannot all be right. It's an impossibility. So Indeed. And um, C.S. Lewis, an English literature writer uh, that uh, was uh, speaking to us in the uh, 19th century, once said Jesus is either a liar, or he is a madman, or he is exactly who he said he was. And, uh, and he's got to be one of the three, because either he was misrepresenting everything that he said and did, and he was an imposter, and nothing that he said was true, and he was misleading everyone, or he was delusional, and he had no idea uh, what he was saying, and, and he was just a madman thinking he was the Messiah like many have in times past, and, and he, again, was misleading folks or he was uh, actually and is God and man, the God, man, the redeemer, the savior, the Lord, and the king of the universe. So he can't be both the king of the universe, God, the Lord, and the God, man, and at the same time, be a liar or a lunatic. It is either one or the other. C.S. Lewis was exactly right. And it is the essential question because, uh, Christianity, in its essence, is just this simple. Jesus saves. But the question becomes, who is this Jesus? And Jesus asks that question. Who do you say that I am? Who do men say that I am? And how that question is answered is everything, because only Jesus saves. So which Jesus is it that saves? Right on. So listen, the line has been drawn in the sand. Why do we believe what we believe and how do we validate and prove it? The Bible says test and prove all things. So let's get right into it. We're going to look at in the word of God, um, John chapter one, verse one, and we're going to have some fun here. So I want you to sit back, break out your Bible if you want. And let's read it. So John chapter one, verse one was written by the apostle um, John himself, the, the one that Jesus loved. And it's interesting, I'll read it. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, check this out. It's interesting that he starts off his gospel with the very, the most important thing that we need to know in life is who is Christ. The very first verse of the Bible in the book of John starts off with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Contra uh, contrast that and compare it to Genesis 1.1 where the Bible starts off with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning means before all time. To my, uh, my science uh, friends in uh, radiation oncology and physics, uh, before there was any matter, energy, space, or time, before the existence of time itself, and we know at one point that all four of these components did not exist uh, based on the Big Bang evidence. So before anything existed, before there was any creation, the Bible tells us here that there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Uh, Scott, can you break it down for us a little? What, is, what does John mean here when he says in the beginning was the word? What is the word? Uh, the word is uh, God's power, God's, God's uh, ability to create from nothing. Um, theologians talk about that as ex nihilo. There was nothing that existed outside of God himself, and God, uh, in his own fellowship, spoke, and he spoke the worlds and all into existence. And, um, and, and that's what we see there at the beginning of the Bible in, in, in Genesis, in the beginning, better sheep, but Elohim, in the beginning, God. That's all there was in the beginning. But then it says, bara, God created uh, the heavens and the earth, the hadats and the ashamayim, the heavens and the earth. So God in his word out of nothing spoke and there became the heavens and the earth. And, um, you, you know, the heavens and the earth and it, life within the earth and everything that we experience, um, there's so much dependency on so many things. There's so many contingencies for so many things to exist. Um, there's, there's nothing that we do that actually doesn't come from intelligence. And it, it, it shows that there is an intelligent, all-powerful being that is before all things who himself is the uncaused cause at the head of all of this. And where it all came from is, is, is God through Amen. his word, through his son, and by the power of his spirit, as uh, Genesis goes on to say that the spirit hovered over the faces of the deep and, um, and God created. So That's we amazing. see Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, and God, the Father, right there at the very beginning of the Bible. And John opens his gospel up, magnifying Jesus, the word of God, the son. In the beginning was the word. Well said, Scott. And Scott, you're a humble man. Guys, Scott is, a, a, if, you, if I may say, he's a Jewish believer. What, what, what do they call it? Messianic believer in Christ. And uh, both he and I, um, I was in another religion when I was 18. We both turned to Christ Jesus. We abandoned everything we had been taught and believed. Uh, we didn't care what friends, family, or people said. Am I right, Scott? But we, we are right. We are. You, you were. No, I mean by what we did. We followed Christ, not the tradition of men, not what my family thought or anyone else. But Scott, keeping consistent here, uh, in the beginning was the word. So the Greek, uh, in the Greek language, translated word means the logos, the logos, L-O-G-O-S, the logos or logos of God. The word logos is the very word in the Greek language that we translate in our English lang language, the word logic. So you could say in the beginning was the logic and the logic yes. was with God and the logic was God. Jesus is the logic of God. In essence, logos means an idea, a communication. It, it's, it's an expression, a revelation. And we find that Jesus Christ is the communication of God to this planet. Jesus Christ is the logic of God. He's the expression of God. He is the revelation of God. So much so that Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father in John 14 and 9. So it says here that Jesus was the word or the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. This here is what and who the Bible says that Jesus Christ is. Is so I'm going to uh, share my screen for just a second. Expand this and let's select this. I want to show you something because it's it's imperative that we understand this. Okay, so Scott, I'm sharing my screen, um, and I'm going to go through a lot of different versions here. It's fun, International Standard Version. Scott, I'm going to ask you to read the last portion. What does it say? In the beginning was the word exist, the word was with God. But I want you to read the last part of each different translations. It's about 26 different Christian translations. What does it okay. say here? It says, and the word was God. Uh, you read the end, I'll God. read the name of the Bible. What does the NET Bible says, say at the end? 
And the word was fully God. Uh, New, Eng New Heart English Bible. And the word was God. And Aramaic. And that word was himself God. Uh, keep going. I'll just let you read it down. You guys could see this. Uh, and keep... God's word translation. And the word was God. New American Standard, 77. The word was God. King James 2000 release. The word was God. The American King James Version. And the word was God. The American Standard Version. And the word was God. The Dowie Reams Bible. And the word was God. The Darby Bible Translation. And the word was God. English Revised Version. And the word was God. Webster's Bible. And the word was God. Weymouth New Testament Bible. And the word was God. The word English Bible and the word was God. And the young literal translation, you got all the way down to the bottom, I can't read it. It says the same thing. <laughs> and the word was God. So now let me let me bring up one more. Uh, stay with me. So we just did that. Uh, Scott, uh, let's see if I have the other one. How about this one? Continue. I'll say the book, you say what it says, New NIV. And the word was God. Living translation. And the word was God. Matter of fact, you could just read, it says all the way down to all of these. Uh, read the contemporary English version at the end. What does that say? And was truly God. Right, and the word was with God, truly God, uh, and so forth and so on. So we have a multiplicity of independent, uh, uh, non-biased translations. They all translate the Greek language as saying, and the word was God. So how come it is, Scott, that the Mormons have, uh, Joseph Smith, rather, he created his own translation, and he doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is God. And even the New World Translation by the Jehovah Witnesses, they had five men within their organization translate the Bible to fit their theology. Why is it that these two different groups deny that Jesus Christ is God, and in light of the overwhelming knowledge and information of all of these documents that all say that Jesus, by the way, I don't even have the um, Amplified here. The Amplified Bible says, and he was God himself, because in the Greek language, it's emphatic. So it's not just, and the word was God, it would say, and the word was God himself. Scott, can you comment on, we have a plethora of accurate um, translations, and yet, the New World Translation by uh, uh, Russell, Charles Russell, Taze Russell, why did he change it? I believe, uh, I believe that what man does to corrupt the Word of God in this particular situation is they try to domesticate or, or to have control over um, salvation by, by making folks believe a lie that Jesus alone does not save, that they somehow have to be involved with the process. Therefore, the whole, you know, the whole faith or, or religious system that they teach is controlled by them. And it has to do with money. It has to do with servitude. It has to do with power. Whoa. It has to do with betrayal and deception. It is, it's, it, there, there's no other reason for it. Simply said, it's sin, it's a lie, and it's the devil. But to look at it from a human point of view, why would they do that? Well, they are taking, they are, they are attempting to take, they are not successfully doing it, but they are attempting to steal the glory away from Christ and away from God, and they are trying to domesticate the Christian religion, which alone, the Christian faith, which alone saves because it leans totally on Jesus, who he is and what he did. And it seeks to bring into their own power that salvation so that they can control you, so that they can build their kingdom, so that they can receive your funds and your support to further their purposes, rather than really to be on board with God and with his purposes and to glorify Christ and which humbles man, which glorifies God, which shows the sinfulness of man and the holiness and the goodness and the mercifulness and the graciousness of God.
So this is what they're up to and they're deceived and we need to be aware of that. That's powerful, Scott. I, you know, and this broadcast, listen, we love our, our uh, Muslim friends and our Jehovah Witness friends and um, Mormon friends. And I, got a, I have friends in all different types of uh, environments. Um, but these things, they cannot reconcile. It's impossible based on the law of contradiction and logic. They cannot be both right and not right at the same time. What the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, and the, and the Muslims say, and what Christians say, are two different, completely irreconcilable truths. And in fact, theirs is not true. Scott, I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to ask you to read, what is John, let's just, you know, I'm quoting um, obviously, uh, we just read all the translations, but what does the actual Greek text say? And before I ask you to do that, Scott's being very humble. He's got a master of science degree in divinity and theological studies. This guy is smart. He's not dumb. Also, he was uh, one of the top ranked wrestlers <laughs> in, no. the, in the state of Florida back in the day. No, 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 no. In, in the county of Broward. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's keep I it straight. That good. So uh, Scott is a warrior. So when we say these things, it's not that we haven't studied and haven't, haven't wrestled with our own upbringing and different things. We believe the word because the word is true. We believe Christ because Christ is true. I just, we just went through 26, approximately 26 translations, and some weren't even in there. I, I added the Amplified uh, Bible. But how about we just go back to the Greek? Scott, can you break it down for us? John chapter 1, verse 1. What does it say? Can you read the Greek, and can you tell us what this says? I, I, I can, um, and I, I will humbly say that my, my life has brought me into a place where I've worked, for the, worked in, in non-ministry-related work for almost 15 years, so I'm not as wet or as practiced in the language as I once was. You want to hear um, me read it? I think you'd much rather read it than me. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but I, I don't have the, uh, the, the whole text in front of me there, but it's... Do you from, see it from, on my screen? Because I'm sharing my screen. Is it not... I don't visible? see the Greek text, though. Where's your Greek text? Uh, right here. It should be on the screen. Archie, N, Ho. No, I'm seeing the different translations. Okay, hold on. So let me try this again. There you uh, go. I apologize. One second. Let me zoom. Can you see it now? Yeah. It's all broken down word by word, but what it says is N R K A Ha Logos Kai Ha Logos Ain Proston Theon Kai Theos Ain Ha Logos. And what the is key. that? What's the literal translation? Can you read the English part of that now? If it was if it was chopped up word by word, it pretty much says in the beginning or the head of was the word or the logos and or even the logos or word was to the God and or even God was the logos now scott why this is beautiful and thank you for reading that why like i'm just referring to the king james why does the king james at the end it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the greek actually says at the end and god it reverses it and god was the word and it's emphatic i understand in the greek so and and god himself was the word why is it flipped in the greek where it says God was the word, but yet in the English translations, it says, and the word was God. Not that it changes the meaning. I just, I'm asking you, why does it reverse that? It, it, it's more that, uh, and, and uh, pardon my English grammar and syntax skills, but, but the Greek does not have an order to its uh, prepositions and its definite uh, articles. And, and nouns, they kind of throw things together. And your context determines uh, what, what verb will go with uh, what noun and so forth. We English folks tend to have a more defined way of our syntax. So it's not that they've reversed anything, it's just the way the Greek language functions comparative to the English language. So there is a translator's choice when it comes down to uh, you know, um, translating these into modern English dialect. 
course, King James is not exactly modern English dialect. It's uh, 1611, uh, you know, Elizabeth English, whereas, um, you know, you might even read uh, a more modern translation such as the English Standard Version or the newest uh, New American Standard Version or the NIV Version. And it, uh, it will be a little different on the whole verse, maybe not the last phrase. It's just uh, that these words in Greek are not always in the same order they would be in I gotcha, um, I gotcha. English. And it's, it's not an error. It's just simply the way the language No, of goes. course. But Scott, to be clear, of the 26 translations we went through approximately, um, they all agreed with each other, regardless of how some of these words were, the order might have been slightly different. But the theme and, and the essence and being true to the Greek language and the rules of translation, they were all accurate, correct? Yes, yes. Now, I got and, a question. And the point how, how does somebody that, come, how does Charles Russell from the Jehovah Witnesses, how does he come on the scene in, in the late 19th century, 1800s? He comes on the scene and where it says, and God was the word, he puts the definite article. I don't know where he grabbed this from, but he puts the definite article and he changes the meaning of the word here, of the scripture. And he says, and a God, and he, he, he puts a capital G to small g, and a God was the word, or the word was a God. Is that supported at all in the Greek language? The original well, manuscripts, and we have about five, over 5,500 different documents and manuscripts from the New Testament. Is that in the New Testament? Is that in this, in this Greek verse? No, what he's doing is he's making it an indefinite article and he's making it a God instead of the God. Um, it, it, Does that it change says, Jesus from being God himself to being a created inferior and subordinate being? Yes, and, and, and if he were to be logical, it's not simply uh, the, a God that he should translate. He should say a word if he's going to keep it consistent because it says literally in the Greek, ha logos, that's the word or the logos. And then it says, ton theon, that's the God, not a God, it's the God. And then it says, ha logos, that's uh, the word or the logos. It's not a, uh, it's not indefinite. Each of those have definite articles. So he's making arbitrarily, um, the definite article before theos, an indefinite article, which makes no sense at all. If he wanted to do that, he should do it all three of the words, but he doesn't. And, um, and he's arbitrarily doing that because the word the is clearly there before the word God, and the word the is clearly there before the word word. That's logos. amazing. I yeah. love what you're saying. So if he was gonna be consistent, he should have said a God was a word which is exactly. completely not, there is no self-respecting scholar, and we've been studying this guy for 40 years, you and I, there's no yes. self-respecting scholar that will validate anything other than what we're seeing here. So that is completely amazing. Of note, and I'm not trying to, uh, again, love the Jehovah Witness, uh, my Jehovah Witness friends, but it is important, we discussed in the beginning, hey, either what Christians believe or what the Muslims, Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons believe, they can't both be right. We got to make a decision. We have to verify. We have to validate. The Bible says, test and try all things. Prove all things. Try the spirits. You can't just go on your emotions and what you've been taught in light of the evidence. So we're presenting evidence that demands a verdict. Yes. So, yes. all right. And what, what this um, a lot of times uh, devolves to is... Um, Folks that argue with Christians will pull, point out the imperfections of Christians and Christianity through the history. Um, I think Christians candidly should admit, and most will, that we are all imperfect. We are sinners. We don't do this Christianity thing um, the way we should all the time. Um, we're not always great witnesses. Um, our history has all kinds of really bad stuff in it as a church, um, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're not saying we're better than anyone else. What we're saying here is Jesus is better than everyone else. Jesus is God, Jesus is man, and Jesus saves, and we desperately need him, 
And if you don't have that message, your own imperfections, because everyone else in every other religion or non-religion has them, I don't care who you are, you're a sinner, you've lied before, and you've been hypocritical before. I have, and I know it. That's why I need Jesus, Amen. the God-man, to save me from my sins because of my sins and because of my shortcomings and because of my imperfections. That's so, why it's so important to know who this Jesus is. Awesome. This is well said. No, well said. You got, you got me nodding my head and I definitely am a sinner too. I mean, this, anybody say they don't need our savior, they're wrong. What's interesting here is that God has determined that the blood of bulls and goats is powerless to take away sins. Any created being does not have perfect, is not perfect. The only one who's perfect is Christ. And the Bible says that God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says that Christ is sinless. He offered a perfect sacrifice on the cross. To wit, if Christ was a created, subordinate, inferior being, his sacrifice on the cross would have been so vastly diminished, it would not have saved mankind. The only one who could save us is God, and that is Christ. Scott, uh, well, well said. I mean, so we went through the 26 uh, translations, in essence. We went through the Greek. I uh, really appreciate how you shared. That's amazing. And God was, you would have to say a word. I mean, it, it destroys the text. No serious scholar would support that. In fact, and I want to share this with my Jehovah Witness friends, you guys know this to be true, but you're told to look the other way, okay? Um, uh, Russell, Charles Russell sued a man because the man in court said that Charles Russell in translating the scriptures doesn't even know the Greek language. So this is a matter of public documentation. Charles Russell went to court to sue this man, but they ended up, this man's attorney put Charles Russell on the stand and asked him, do you read and understand Greek? Charles Russell says he does. They handed him a Greek text, and they said, can you read any of the words in Greek? And he could not. Okay, let's break it down simpler. Can you read, Mr. Russell, any of the Greek words? And he could not. He just fumbled around. He said, look, I'm not really that good at it. He's a liar. And what he... What he presented, guys, we're not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but either it's the truth or it's a lie. Either Jesus is who he said he is, or like Scott says, he's a liar. Either the Bible, John 1.1, 1, 1, is true, 26 translations, the Greek text itself is true, or it's a lie. It cannot logically be both. So Scott, grammatically, linguistically, historically, biblically, supernaturally, Jesus is identified as the word of the living God, Revelation 19 and 11 says this, John said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he has a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he is called the word King of Kings. Yeah. Amen. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it says, and he himself was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, wait for it, and his name, his name is called the Word of God. Scott, Jesus isn't just identified as the Logos of God, that's also his name. It's not just what he is, it's who he is, according to Revelation 19. He is the logic of God. Now, God has two indisputable attributes that cannot be attributed to anyone else. God, number one, in all of Scripture, exists from eternity to eternity. Psalms 90 says, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And so he's the, he's the eternal being. Secondly, he's the creator. By the fact that Christ created everything there is, and by the fact that he is a non-created eternal being, God himself, these two components validate that he is God himself. He is God himself. And one of the ways we see that in, in especially the New Testament is he actually accepted worship. When he was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, the devil had offered him the kingdoms of this world. Not that he really could, 
maybe the fallen kingdoms of this world, which they, we all are, the whole world is fallen. Um, but he said, if you will just simply bow down and worship me, I will give you, Jesus, all of this. And Jesus says, uh, the Lord only shall you serve, and him only shall you worship. And, and Jesus said that to Satan. I'm paraphrasing, but that's, that's the temptation and, and the pushback that Jesus gave the devil when the devil wanted Jesus to serve him, and the devil offered the kingdoms of the world. Well, later in the ministry of Jesus, after he rose and after he had uh, commissioned his apostles, they worshipped him, Scripture says. He didn't push them away. And uh, he accepted their worship. Even the apostles, as they went on in their mission throughout the book of Acts, there were folks that thought that they were God or gods. And uh, they came to worship at one point Peter. And Peter rebuked those folks. I believe it was in Acts chapter 14. Mm -hmm. said, stand up. I'm a man like yourself. Worship God. Yet Jesus, on many occasions, I've accepted worship from people and yet taught consistently that only God can be worshiped. And we know only God can be worshiped, you know, from the Old Testament, from, from the Ten Commandments, from commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, from hold on, Scott. Let, two, let, you shall let, make no graven images. Scott, let me so, ask you a question. That's amazing. So if Charles Russell, in wrongfully translating the Bible, says that Jesus is a created being, and yet Jesus is worshipped and accepts worships, wouldn't that be polytheism? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be wor uh, pantheism? Wouldn't that be worshipping more than one God? Because they, according to him, you have God Almighty, and then you have a created being that he's calling a little g God, but yet he accepts worship. That would mean they believe in the plurality of worship of multiple gods, and that's idolatry. Am I off on this? I, well, it would, be, it would definitely be idolatry, and yes, it would be. Now, Charles Russell, we're talking about Charles Russell. I believe he was the, uh, the leader of the Jehovah Witnesses, which is very similar yes. to, to Mormonism. And um, in, in, in this sense, they both understand the Bible, which they both will read, but they both will only read it through the lens of their further revelation. Right. Joseph Smith has, uh, and Charles Brigham Young will read it through the Book of Mormon. And Charles Taz Russell and the Jehovah Witnesses will read their Bible through the traditions of the Jehovah Witnesses and the ongoing interpretations coming from their apostolate. So you can only understand the Bible through their lens of the Bible, and you cannot depend on the Bible itself or alone to derive who God is, who Jesus is, and how you're to worship him and understand him. And that's, uh, that's what they're doing. They are redirecting you to a false Jesus, which is idolatry. And in, and in their theology, you're right. There are many gods, and they are all to be worshipped. In fact, in Mormon theology, you can evolve into a god to be worshipped. Not only that, so, you can own your own planet and have multiple celestial wives. I, I could see how people wanted to follow that. I, <laughs> um, Scott, um, so we're, we're going to break this down because uh, this is like so good and interesting. It's amazing. But I do want to finish the, uh, the next two verses. And let's connect that with everything you just said. So it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. We, we've spent time on this and the word was God. The next verse says... Um, the same, in case you didn't get verse one, he repeats it in verse two. He says, the same Logos was in the beginning with Theos. Okay, so the same Jesus, the logic of God was in the beginning with God. But I want to get to this last verse, verse three, and spend the rest of our time on this. And again, Scott, we really appreciate you coming out today. I mean, I don't know how many thousands of people are going to get to hear this, but it's, it's a tremendous truth that has to be told. It's inescapable. And what these cults, basically a cult is someone who once was Christian and then they left us. First John, it said, in First John, it says, they went out from among us because they were not truly of us. They apostatized from the truth of the gospel of Christ. They minimize 
God, the creator, to something to be created in, in a, a created form, they minimize who Christ is. So check this out. Um, it says, the next verse says, this, this, this is amazing. So check this out. If anybody can refute this, hey, shoot us an email. By the way, Scott and I uh, openly challenge anybody who wants to debate us publicly. We will debate these points. And if you feel you have a leg to stand on, hey, man, with all respect, we want you to come on the show and we want to debate with you. And if what you're saying is true and you believe in logic and then, then and you're going to test and prove all things, let's see, because we both can't be right. Okay, check this out. It says all things, verse three, Scott, this is crazy good. All things were made by him, Christ, Logos, the logic of God. All things were made by him. And in case you didn't get the, the first part of verse three, he says it again. He says it again. And he says, and without him was not anything made that was made. Again, we're in the book of John chapter one, verse three. All things were made by him. And then it repeats it, the second part of the verse. And without him was not anything made that was made. Okay. So there's no exclusionary provisions in the grammatical and the Greek language here. When it says all things, it means all inclusive, without exception. Um, and in case you didn't get it again, he says it again, the second part of the verse, and without him was not anything made that was made. Well, Scott, we're told that Jesus Christ in the book of Colossians and other places, it says all things were made and came in existence through him, and without him was not even one thing made that, it, that was made and so forth. Uh, all things were made in, in, in him and for him, and he is before all things. We get into Colossians. And in him all things consist. That means atomically, to my science friends, every atom, every proton, neutron, and electron, every sub-aspect uh, of, of nature is not only created by Christ, but it's being sustained by Christ, by the word of his power. I got a question for you, Scott. Verse 3 again says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything that and it was not anything made that was made. If Christ, as Charles Russell asserts, as, um, as the Mormons assert, more specifically Joseph Smith, they assert he's a created being. Can you please explain that to me, Scott, and to the listeners? How do you reconcile if he's a created being with verse three that says all things were made by him? Can you, un can you unpack that for us? Because I'm struggling with their logic. Well, it, it, it's illogical because he would have to create himself. And in order to do that, he wouldn't be there if he wasn't created yet. So <laughs> That's I, awesome. I don't get that either. Hold on. Say that again. Say that again. That was too good. Say that again. So to, to create himself, he would have to be there to begin with. That's unfathomable. It's illogical. It, it runs against that whole rule of law of non-contradiction that you talked about. You can't create yourself because you don't exist to create yourself to begin with. There has to be an uncaused cause that created everything, and that's God and God's word. Amen. You know, if, if a cause cannot create itself. That's right. You can't be both the cause and the effect. Again, Ladies and gentlemen, we're just presenting rules for thought and, and meaningful dialogue. You can't violate the second law, uh, but actually there's three laws in, in, in logic and philosophy that state this. You can't be both the creator and not the creator at the same time. Am I right, Scott? Yes, you can't. Okay. Well, Muhammad so Ali can't be the greatest in the same place and at the same time if Mike Tyson is the greatest. That's right. It can be at a different time, but not at the same time and in the same place. And in the same manner. Again, the, the, the law the of contradiction way. states it cannot be both raining and not raining at the same time, in the same place, in the same way. So uh, right. the Amplified Bible, all of the translations all agree with this, that all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. It's a logical impossibility to create yourself. I challenge all of the Mormons. I challenge all of my Muslim friends. I challenge all of Jehovah Witnesses. I challenge any of my friends in, in medical physics to prove the law of contradiction to be wrong, to prove that, you, that it's not applicable here. 
the Bible not only agrees with, it affirms the laws of logic. Because God not only created the physical material world in which we live, but this immaterial things that God created that didn't happen by accident. For example, love, hope, joy, peace, and wait for it, logic. You cannot deny the laws of logic and say that Jesus Christ is both a created being and not a created being, being at the same time in the same way and at the same place. It's true. And I love in the, in the book of Hebrews, in the first chapter, the eighth verse, where the father is speaking about the angels, and then he directs his attention to the son. And he says, but of you, O son, thy throne is forever and ever, ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. God the father is telling God the son that he is eternal forever and ever and king. And so there's, there's no way that he can be a created being per God the Father and at the same time be the creator per the word of God. That's well said. And Scott, I'm going to read one scripture here in the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. You guys ready for this? This is powerful. For by him were, here we go, all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, it repeats it. All things were created by the Logos, by Christ. And not only were they created by him, all things were created by him and for him, indicating he is God. Only God is to be worshiped. And then it says in verse 17, it says it really clear, my friends. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. In the Greek language, it talks about it, like I said, an atom. Jesus not only created the universe and all that there is, visible or invisible, and we understand from laws of physics that there's approximately 13 different dimensions. The Bible refers to 13 different dimensions, Scott. That's pretty amazing, right? Uh, I'm, I'm a science man, so I love it. But Christ not only created all things, all things were created, the Bible says in Colossians, inside of him. He created all things in him. Inside of Christ, he created everything, and he holds it together. Whoa, back up. This is getting crazy. You're telling me that Christ Jesus encompasses 13 point whatever billion years of light traveling at 186,000 miles 886,400 miles per second for over 13 billion years, Christ encompasses the entirety of his creation. Scott, what are the, what are, there's three words that describe om, omniscient or, or God. What are the three omnis? Can you break that down for us? Well, he's all powerful, omnipotent, which means he has all power. He is the creator of all things. He upholds all things, as Colossians says. Um, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, not a bird in the air will fall to the ground without the Father, without his power. Um, you can't add an inch to your height or your stature without God making that happen. Not a hair of your head will fall to the ground without God being in control. He is all-powerful. Others would say he is sovereign, and, uh, and that means he is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He doesn't, that's omniscient, all-knowing. He knows all things. He knows all contingencies, yet his knowledge is contingent on nothing. You know, there's, there's got to be a gazillion things that happen for you just to go on an airplane and make a trip to go somewhere. Think about the bazillion, gazillion things that have to happen for the whole world to happen all the time. And God knows all those things, and he knows it because he's all-powerful making it all happen. His knowledge is always certain. It's never contingent. God knows all contingencies, but he knows nothing at all contingently. And God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. There is nowhere that God is not. Um, even, even if you don't go to heaven, um, you go, according to scripture, you go to hell. And a lot of people will say that God is not in hell. Well, God is in hell. God's wrath and God's justice and God's power is in hell. 
taking out his vengeance and his uh, and and his justice upon unrighteousness right there in hell. There is no place where God is not. God fills all things. So God's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. But Scott, that is completely amazing. We're going to wrap this this talk up now. Uh, again, today's talk. Uh, again, thank you, Scott, for being with us. I could see we're going to have to do uh, some uh, some additional uh, uh, recordings on this because this is amazing. We didn't run from it. We didn't hide from it. We attacked it straight on. We spoke the truth. Again, we spoke. Uh, we 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 shared what what our friends believe and what the Bible believes. We talked about the second or the law of contradiction. I'm thinking about the second law of th thermodynamics. We'll have to get into that another time. But um. And we talked about the greatest question that you could ever be asked, which Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And that wasn't as important to Christ as the second part of that question in Matthew chapter 16. They said, some say you're John the Baptist, some a prophet, some Elijah, one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? I am calling on each person within the sound of our voice to take responsibility, unplug from your organization, unplug from everything and everyone, and come before God, read the word of God, John chapter one, verse one, two, and three. Uh, approach it, not just prayerfully, like the Mormons always want you to just, oh, just pray about it. Listen, the Mormons tell me they prayed about the Book of Mormon and it's true. Well, my Muslim friend said they prayed about the book, the Quran, they say it's true. Again, it's a contradiction. They cannot be both true at the same time. What we're telling you to do is what Jesus said and what the Bible says, is to test and prove all things, ind independently validate and verify all truth. President Reagan said, trust, but verify. But verify. In conclusion, is do you say that Jesus is a created being? As the Mormons say, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Muslims, and maybe others. Is he just a created, inferior, subordinate being? And they don't know if he's Michael, the Archangel, or Jesus, or maybe he's Mike. It's a little schizophrenic. Um, is, is he a created being? Is the God that is the Jesus that you worship and serve, the one who died on the cross for you, just a created being? Uh, actually, in the Mormons say that the Heavenly Father had sex with the Heavenly Mother, and they produced spirit children, and they say that Jesus is the spirit brother to Lucifer. If you believe any of these things, it's completely alien to the New Testament. Scott and I basically did an exegesis on one verse john 1 1 actually went into verse 2 and 3 not as in depth but we explain these things it's incontrovertible it's indefensible please accept the god of the bible accept who jesus is who we who the bible says he is who the 12 hand-picked apostles that he selected said he is and worship christ as the lord and savior and the logos and the and divinity itself scott you want to close this out for us Yes, uh, Jesus is 100% God. We didn't talk about Jesus also being 100% man a lot. That would be a good place to go. Right. But if he, if he wasn't, if he's, if he's less than God, he can't save us because God is eternally angry against sin and unholiness, and it takes an eternal being to receive that eternal wrath. And, and that's why. Jesus is both God and man. Jesus, the man, lived under the law and lived the life that we haven't lived. We've all fallen wickedly short of God's law, God's will, God's mission for our lives. And that's why Jesus came. He came and he lived the life that we were charged to live but have not. And, and as a man, he fulfilled the, the law of God, the will of God, and stood in our place and took upon himself as the God-man, the wrath of God, which is eternal, against a fallen creation. And there is where we have the cross and the magnification of Christ, the cross in its resurrection and its meaning. It is right there where Jesus saves us from our sin by because he is God, he is the God-man. He is the God-man that was a 